Welcome to Aurora Connects. This is episode 17 for Friday, July 24th, 2020, Aurora Designers. I'm Dawn Monique Williams, Associate Artistic Director of Aurora Theater. And as always, I'm joined by Artistic Director Josh Costello. Hi, Josh. Hey, Dawn, how are you? I'm good. Um, I picked a little something special for my quote this week All in right. honor of our guests. This is from Paula Vogel's Indecent. Title, Indecent. Lights up, soft, muffled music. Slowly in a dim light, a body stirs on stage. The light grows. We see a dusty figure in an old suit. He stretches his limbs that haven't moved in decades. He lifts one arm, sawdust pours from his sleeve. He lifts the other arm, more sawdust. He shakes his legs vigorously, more outpouring of sawdust. Title, from the ashes they rise. The troop rises and shakes off their dust as Limo steps on the platform. Title, Limo introduces the troop. So that's um, some of the opening uh, stage directions from Indecent. And it has such a different feel when you're when you're thinking about it from the point of view of a designer reading this. Um, mm-hmm. Reading this as an audience member, it's like, oh, that sounds lovely. And as a designer, you're like, wait, sawdust falls out of your sleeve? How are we going to do that? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, before we um, welcome our guests in, I just want to remind viewers to comment on Facebook or in the YouTube um, chat room. You can ask us questions for today's episode that we'll pass on, or you can make suggestions for future episodes. And of course, you can always email us at connects at auroratheater.org. Um, and I often forget to remind you folks that you can also listen to each episode in a podcast format. We are available on Stitch, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. So remember to hit like and subscribe. And we are offering memberships for our 2020-2021 season. Memberships include access to all of the online programming that we are putting together. And if we are able to reopen and do live performances in our space, your membership will include tickets to those performances as well. So please go to auroratheater.org, check out our membership program and all of the things that we're putting together for you. Uh, And while you're there, you can click the donate button and help us uh, get through this situation. Thank you so much. Great. And now um, I'd love to welcome our guests to the screen. Um, Some beloved Aurora designers. Some have worked on many, many shows at Aurora over the years. Um, Some are more new to the Aurora family and we look forward to having them back with us. So we're going to welcome Cliff Carruthers, Stephanie Johnson, Richard Olmsted, and Maggie Whitaker. Hey, friends. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Right. Doing all right. Cool. Well, to kick it off, we would love to just, um, in a sort of quick roundtable fashion, have you each give us, you know, a brief background, how you came to be a designer and what shows you've done at Aurora. And for those of you like Cliff and Richard that I've worked with away from Aurora, we could talk about those shows too. So, um, I'm just gonna follow our layout here on the screen and start with Cliff. <laughs> well, um, let's see. I've been at, uh, working as a theater a theater sound designer for about 20 years. Um, uh, I moved out to the San Francisco area to take an internship at ACT in 2000. And um, that's sort of how I opened up um, this area um, for work um, and uh, shortly thereafter uh, I hooked up with uh, Theater Works and was the resident sound designer there for about six years until 2009. Um, since then I've been um, a freelance designer in the area, uh, also teaching at Stanford and SF State the last couple of years. Um, uh, cobbling it together for years and years, hoping to keep it going. You know, what are, what are some of the shows you've done at Aurora? Oh well, let's see. the uh, The very first one I did uh, was uh, the Trestle at Poplet Creek, um, which is reaching way back in the. I think that was the second show in the new space, um, uh, directed by Soren Oliver. Uh, it was that was a great production. Uh, let's see other other things over the years. I I, I um, 
uh, really loved uh, Detroit, which is one that Josh directed. Uh, big fan of that play. Um, let's see, other memorable, uh, the the elaborate entrance of Chad Deity was another one. I We, we had a lot of fun with, uh, with John Tracy on that show. Um, the most recent one, the, the Year of Magical Thinking. Um, other ones, I'm, I'm they're slipping my mind now. Detroit '67 was a great play. That was just last year, so um, so lots of great productions over the years. Great, Stephanie. We'll come to you next. Uh, I'm new to Aurora, although since I've been doing lighting design for 46 years, this year, 46. Uh, Congrats. Years, so I may have worked with Aurora way, 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 way back when. Um, my background is that I went to Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts for theater and uh, took a lighting design course the second to last semester and fell into it and loved it and moved here in 77 and really enjoyed it. I had a great time. Uh, Josh and I worked on Exit Strategy together and that was a very challenging play because everybody was everywhere it was the present, it was the past, it was the future. It was really, it was kind of a slam dunk for me to start working at Aurora. It wasn't a straight ahead play. It was very nuanced. And so I appreciated that and we worked very well together. And uh, I'm really looking forward to working with Aurora again as soon as we get back on the boards and oh, off yes. the screen. <laughs> oh yes, Maggie, welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, my first show was The Shape of Things, um, and that was when Tom Ross brought me on. And um, you know, it was my first show at the Aurora, and that was back in, I want to say that was 2003? I think so. I think so. And it was the time that I learned that I both loved and wanted to slap Neil Labute upside the head. <laughs> <laughs> don't that hasn't changed um and i've i've been really lucky to call the aurora a creative home ever since um and it's been a really lovely experience working with josh um over the last couple of years uh on so many really great shows uh exit strategy Ernest, and uh eureka day which as a working not so much working at the moment but uh working parent and as i'm looking at my keyboard i'm like i don't want parenting parent um i've had some very eureka day like moments as a adult parent person uh dealing with public schools and facebook live meetings and the chat comments going um so it feels like the the stories that i've gotten to be a participant in telling at the aurora have been really special and they keep having resonance for years and years and years but i've been working and living in the bay area for over 20 years I got my start here um, at a children's theater down in Sunnyvale as an assistant uh, in the costume shop, and then came up to the city and started working at SF Shakes, working at Berkeley Rep as an assistant, and then just freelance um, designing where I could. I feel like I've been uh, designing shows near Cliff at a table off and on for almost 20 years, which is a really lovely place to be. Um, so everybody in this room virtually that I'm staring at right now, Richard, Stephanie, Don, and Josh, you are all people that have been lovely collaborators that I either have gotten to spend a, sh a bucket of time with, or, <laughs> um, not enough time with, and I'm hoping that when the apocalypse is over, we get more time together. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's to seeing you all in a dark room soon. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, and certainly, last but not least, Richard, you might have the most extensive Aurora resume of any human being besides <laughs> Tom Ross. <laughs> um, tell us about yourself, Richard. So I uh, thank you. I, uh, I grew up in Berkeley and uh, started doing lighting at Berkeley High. And uh, did some other jobs after college and stuff, but went back to grad school and became a lighting and set designer and moved here back here in 92. And I think my third show was at Aurora. And I think that, that was like Aurora's third or fourth show. So I've sort of my whole career in set design has grown up 
with Aurora. Uh, and I, you know, it was a tiny startup when we started at the Berkeley City Club. I used to build everything myself in my garage. Mm -hmm. in the back. And uh, put it on the roof of my Honda Civic and drive it over to the City Club. And uh, I, I built probably, I don't know, 25 sets that way. Not all at Aurora, all over the place in the Bay Area. Uh, but I teach at Cal State East Bay. I've been there for 15 years now, Dawn's alma mater. And uh, uh, I've loved, I've, I love teaching too. So um, I've, the recent shows I've done at Aurora, I, I did Detroit 67 with Cliff. I did Eureka Day with uh, Maggie and, and Josh. And uh, uh, I did, uh, what are some other ones? Oh, the well, you did just you, you did design loot. <laughs> the designs for loot were done. <laughs> I am so sad. I did uh, like I did my whole job for loot. I did the. I, it was pretty much done for me. Um, and I missed the first rehearsal, which I heard was awesome, because um, because I was uh, we were in dress rehearsals for my school show, which also canceled that week. So. Um, two shows on the same day canceled. Right, so that one right at the end too. So anyway, yeah, I think the set model for Lute is still sitting downstairs from oh, that, that first rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the room is still set for Lute rehearsals the way yeah. the way we left it. I think. Yeah. Anyway, um, I just have a. a Oh, please, Richard, go ahead. No, no. I, I was just going to say, it's been my great honor to work at Aurora for a long time. And uh, I've seen it grow and into a really incredible organization. Very proud of it. Well, you've been a big wow. part of it, Richard. You've made a lot of, a lot of beautiful sets for us. Thank you. Um, and I just had a quick follow-up. I, I heard Stephanie and Richard both mention um, going to school for design. Cliff and Maggie, did you, did you study theater at, at uni or anything like that? Yeah, I'm a one trick pony, man. I did an <laughs> undergrad for costume design at, um, in Florida in the 90s. And then I went to grad school for costume design at UCSD uh, in 2000 to 2005 to 2008. Um, I, just, I just sent my mentor a embarrassing, uh, hap embarrassingly sweet, I hope, happy birthday song. Um, <laughs> because I'll keep in touch with her, so yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, I, I came at sound design as a musician, as a composer, I think as a lot of sound designers do, I think. Um, so I actually went back to grad school to study electronic music and, um, it just happened that the, um, sound design department had a studio on the same floor and, um, I just wandered down the hall and ended up doing a play and really liked it and ended up falling into that program instead of, uh, electronic music so um so I was I sort of backed into the career and um the other joke I like to say is I went into theater as a practical move away from <laughs> I want to ask you guys maybe we'll start with Stephanie when when you get hired for a gig and you get a, a script um what's your what's your what are you looking for when you when you first crack that script open and you know you're gonna you're gonna light it or you're gonna design it um, what do you, how do you read the script and what, do, what are you, what are you reading it for? Well, you know, there's two sides uh, of reading the script. There's the practical side, time of day, location, um, all of those practical things. And then, of course, there's the underlying uh, meanings, narrative that, that's going on. So I read it once through uh, for the practical you know, and are there lamps, not lamps? Are there practical devices on the stage? Um, indoors, outdoors, all of those kinds of things. And oh, there, yeah, there's how I learned what I learned. And of course, in the postmodern era, nothing is where it is. It's somewhere else, it's something else. And so I've had to kind of be very fluid with the technical side and move more toward the narrative side. You know, color, uh, rhythm, um, what is shown and what is invisible, what is in the shadows. So it's been, it's been, it's been interesting. I'm, I feel very privileged and happy 
to have been able to do it so long that um, I've watched things change. And you know, when I have three assistants, I'm going to put uh, a shout out to them, Minerva Ramirez, I think you know her, um, and uh, Shauna Ray and Edward Lipson. All of those young people helped me with the technical side, um, drafting things, new instrumentation, uh, various things. And so, uh, you know, I'm learning as I go. And the basic foundational things that I learned really still hold true and hold me instead. Um, but the new ways to express those things are something that I'm learning about as quickly as they change. What's, let me follow up on that. What's, what's an example of like a foundational um, aspect of lighting design or, or lighting design theory that, that you say holds true regardless of the, of the technology? The foundational thing is when the mouth is moving, you got to see it. <laughs> because if people can't see the face, they feel like they can't hear. And Cliff might uh, attest to that as well. If they can't see, they think they can't hear, then they space out and they miss everything else. I mean, I think oh, that's it's... the bottom line. <laughs> Mouth moving. I mean, it's different in dance or it's different, different moments. Like the moment when Margot walked down the stairs and we didn't see her until she hit the stage. Um, but in general, bottom line, mouth moving, got to see the face. And I would say if there's not enough front light, the microphones that end up getting turned up. A yeah. more. <laughs> it's that perception. Even if it's not physiologically accurate, it's the perception we can't see, we can't hear, we space out after a while. Thanks, Cliff. I'd, I'd like to just add, it's a problem of focus in theater because you have such a wide view. And like, if you think of it a big theater, the people are tiny. Uh, and so creating okay. focus is, is the first and most important thing you have to do. It's not like watching a movie where your, your whole field of vision is the panoramic. Or, or the chosen thing to look at, you're just looking at the screen. In theater, you have to direct the audience to see what they're supposed to see at every moment. From every and, I would say, and I would say objectively that theater is a better art form I than film agree. for the most part. But you know, that's my prejudice. That is true. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> And Maggie, what about for you? I mean, I bet uh, as a costume designer, there's there's a whole other raft of things that that come in when you're when you're looking at a script. Um, for me, I'm always thinking. You know, first I want to find out how I feel about the story. Is the story something that I feel like I can tell well? Um, is the story something that I've always either always wanted to tell, or that I feel like I can really. Um, bring something to that's really special um man i do love all those plaids uh <laughs> and you know is it on my bucket list is it a new play i love i mean i love Ernest, but i also really love new plays and that's one of the things that's i've been most excited about is making things that haven't been seen before and helping people see their work for the first time and giving them that chance to see what the possibilities are. And as a designer, I don't like being painted into a corner. Like if we get into tech and something's not working, I wanna be able to address it. So it's a, sometimes it's a lot easier in a new play to be able to make that possible because if that's the intention is the, or the expectation that you are going to be having to rethink things because the script is going to be rethought. And when you are dealing with an established canon that is where the playwright is beyond dead, there's a certain flexibility again, because they're not in the possibly there is no um, state that is carefully monitoring how their work is being done. So you have a lot of license once again, and it's what you bring into the room that's really special. But um, you know, it's I, the thing for me is always like, what can I bring to a story can I serve the story? Can I release the story? Um, and then it becomes a question of then reading it for practical stuff. Like I don't even, I honestly, I don't care how many costume changes there are in a story or how technically difficult or easy it is. If I don't love the play, I don't want to do it. And if I love the play, I don't care how much it's going to beat me up. I still want to do it. Mm -hmm. 
And, yeah. and Maggie, just following up on that, and then I'd love to hear from, from others on this as well. Um, what makes you love a play? Like what are, what excites you um, in a script? What's like a great play? Oh, there's no one great play for me, but I think what it gets to is like, I get ignited by words. I've always been somebody who gets excited by the way people use words. So I will always be suckered by a playwright who is using words in a way that seduces my mind. Um, and then if the story is strong and if the problems that the story addresses are interesting and if the characters are complicated and if it's not filled with men doing all the work and women standing by the sidelines okay. waiting for by the phone for something <laughs> to happen to their man, you know, I'm not interested in that story for the most part. I want to like it takes a very special story for me to deal with uh, a bunch of men doing man things and like maybe two women in a corner somewhere. Like that's not, this, that again, new place. I don't want to, I, I don't need to retell stories that don't interest me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of my thing. Definitely, mm -hmm. I see you nodding vigorously. What, what gets you hot for a play? Um, something I've never heard before something that makes me weep. Um, I was working on a play with Ubuntu, uh, it's called Hurt Village. And um, it was so raw that one night I just told the director, I'm not coming. I'm not coming mm -hmm. tonight. It's too raw. I'm taking myself out to an Italian dinner to recover. But I mean, I was so, it was so evocative. Um, when I worked on Exit Strategy, I am somebody that went to the public schools in New York. At the time when I went to the public schools, the 50s and the 60s, they were not um, in the shape that the exit strategy was presenting. But I recognized Margot. I recognized all of those teachers from my life. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I can hear a story about the a Black experience that rings true, then I want to bring my best to it. I, I, I inhabit that story. I, I illuminate that story, you know, uh, and it's meaningful to me. I remember I was working at a theater, not to be named, but I, I said, um, they told me I could have two comps. And I said, does that, does that count me as well? And they said, yeah. And I said, but I want to come and see this play as often as I want to see it. And what the production manager said to me was, We've never had a lighting designer that wanted to come back after opening night. <laughs> but for me, particularly if it's a story about black experience in America, um, like Kill Move Paradise or like uh, Exit Strategy, I want to come and see it when I want to come and see it, especially if it's right here in my town. So I get very caught up in the stories. I, 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 it, it means a lot to me. Cliff, what are you looking for in a script? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I think the first thing I do when I read a script is, you know, I, I think sound is a little different from, from other design mediums in that you sort of have to design, figure out what your role actually is on any particular play um, to a larger degree. Um, you know, on any particular play, I might be writing a little music or I might be trying to find the perfect vibe from a particular period. Um, uh, we might be using microphones. You know, there's just all kinds of things that roll into what the job uh, is going to actually entail on that particular play. Um, so uh, that's what keeps me coming back. You know, the, the, the variety there is, is something that keeps me interested. Uh, and there's something um, uh, uh, Stephanie said um, um, about, um, I forget how you put it exactly. Um, well, anyway, um, uh, for me, going to, working on a play and going to the theater is like going to church. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for plays that will take me to a divine place you know, mm -hmm. and however you get there yes. is, is, um, is sort of not necessarily relevant and might have different technical paths as far as, you know, our work goes. Um, um, yeah. 
So put it that way. Yeah, Richard, do you have a thought about? Well, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip it around a little bit and, and um, say, I, you know, we don't, as designers, we don't get to choose the plays. Like, so it's whether you want to do this play or not. And I usually, if I could do it, if I could fit in my schedule, I want to do it. Um, and so it, it comes a curious thing where I think you, you end up sort of liking the play that you're working on now more than you would necessarily if you're just reading it and evaluating it for what you would do. And I think it's an important part of working actually, because you have to, you, you sort of have to engage in a, in a kind of deep way. And so you, you have to sort of like it and whether you would or not. Um, so that being said, uh, I love plays that are engaging um, intellectually. I love old, I love plays. I love world premiere plays. We've had some amazing playwrights in the Bay Area over the years. I, I was lucky to work with um, Octavio Solis in some of my early days working here. And mm -hmm. I, I think he's, he's like our Shakespeare to me. Um, and uh, I love working on Shakespeare. I've done a lot of Shakespeare over the years in lots of different ways. And I've done it in tiny rooms with um, six people in the cast or uh, big stages with full sort of traditional companies. So um, I don't know, I, I'm not that picky. <laughs> <laughs> but I love working I, I love the work so it's uh, well know. part of the joy is being a chameleon right Richard as a designer yeah. you know you get to try on all those different hats um, exactly yeah, it, maybe in a way that even actors don't get to do you know it's um, it, it's very freeing experience what? when you get, get to do Just, that one time I told I told my wife um, I don't really do musicals you know, for, I don't right. know. I, right. I always like right. serious plays. I always like serious. Right. Plays. I don't do musicals. I did the Sound of Music three years in a row. Right after I said that, and it was sort of like a, a, you know, bolt from above, and karmic justice. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I've done. I've done probably I don't know twenty or thirty. I do a musical every year now at school, and I've done many, many since. And so. I actually love the sound of music more the third time than the first time. And so <laughs> it's weird, you know, you sort of. Well, those old Rogers and Hammerstein musicals, they're so well put together, you know, you can really, you can really see the like craft in them. Machine. It's like a little machine. That you have it is a machine. My, my mother prejudiced <laughs> me against, against musical theater. My mother is the one that got me into theater. And she worked in the American Negro Theater in the 50s in New York uh, before I was born. And she was like, musical theater is not really theater. And so even after I did all of my training, I came to with, with, a, with a deep prejudice that musical theater was not actually theater. I mean, I've gotten over that prejudice and musical theater is indeed theater. It's its own genre, yeah. but um, you know, relating to what Richard said. It's heightened, it's extra. It's the one moment where you can, can take a really dark subject and you can say this really dark subject is going to have a song and dance blowout number and we're going to add sequence and a disco ball or whatever and somehow <laughs> it is justified it is valid because the art form is so heightened says the person who is part of a musical theater company as well um and finds i need an outlet for all my sequence so there you go <laughs> I would just say to you know the I've I I remember saying I would never ever work on a musical so that's hilarious now but um uh but I I think you know the musicals that I worked on that have really worked you can just feel uh, the number of people in the room focusing on a single outcome uh it's just it's just really special when you get to get that kind of teamwork with a, a hundred people in a room and they're all doing the same thing. You know, I personally, you know, as a designer, I prefer a little more intimate projects, but uh, there really is something special to, you know, in a full band and a full cast and all the, you know, talented crew and everything are just making it happen. It's, it's, it can be pretty special. I, I, I'm wondering what, what, what you all think about filmed musical, you know, musicals that then become films. I'm wondering what my designer 
colleagues think about that? Oh, I got into movie musicals as like my gateway drug into theater. It first was like movie musicals because my parents were old as heck. So, well, my dad was super old. So it was like all those Howard Keel um, movie musicals from like the 50s. And then it was Summerstock Theater rehashed mm -hmm. some of those movie musicals. And that was that was it. Like, I, done. Um, I don't want to do those musicals for no money because I don't want to deal with a 30 person chorus and like a thousand dollar budget. But yeah, yeah, I'm also not a masochist, but <laughs> otherwise, I, I mean, I don't want to watch Cats ever again, but um, <laughs> but I did it for science. Same, same. <laughs> Let me ask Josh, you guys. This. Yeah, I see you chomping wait, at the bit. Yeah, well, I, I want to ask. I'm going to get into it, like like the the creative process a little bit more. Like once you once you've you know you, you've gotten the script and you you're you've done your preparation work and you're you're starting to talk with the director, um and and make the choices about you know there's first there's that like anything is possible so you know let's explore but then there's like no okay we're going to choose this and not that. How do those choices get made for you and what 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 do directors say that you you love to hear or that you you hate it when a director says that? I'm asking because I want to be a better director. Um, what do you what do you love hearing from a director? What do you hate hearing from a director? And how do you get to like this is the direction we're going with a with a script that could go a, a few different directions? I'll I'll start. Um, I mean, I always start with research. I do a lot of research, a lot of visual research, and usually you've had some you know quick talk with the director uh, that gives you some some idea. You know, is it realistic? Is it more abstract is it um you know there's lots of ways of a play could, there's lots of different ways a play could be realistic um, so visual research i think could be first of all kind of what stephanie was saying the, the nuts and bolts factual kind of stuff um what do the refrigerators look like in this time or, or what did they do for refrigeration <laughs> whatever um, but then there's inspirational research too you know just something that that uh, you know can lead you as a counterpoint maybe to the kind of realism of it. Um, so then I, I mean, I just try to, I, I put forward something and, and it's a conversation with the director, right? It's, it's back and forth. You have to be a good listener, make sure you're hearing what, uh, you know, the, the, not just what they're saying, but the subtext of what they're saying so that you can, you know, so you can really get it. And, and uh, the conversation, I think, is what leads it towards a, a design. Mm -hmm. I know with, um, with Eureka Day, um, with Richard and, and Maggie both, um, it was really important to me with that show because the characters were all Berkeley parents. It was really important to me that the designers all be people who are in that world, who are parents, you know, raising their kids in the East Bay right now, so that it felt really authentic. And I love how that turned out. There's the photo there. I mean, both the set where you can see, you know, the the bay out the window as if we're in Berkeley Hills, and we had we knew exactly where it would have been, and um, and then these costumes that that are so uh, familiar, Maggie. We had a great time, sort of looking. I think we looked at photos of your friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, like half of the my kids' preschool, which is like a intensely hippie voodoo kind of like play based like if you're in underpants as long as you're in underpants kind of like you're not breaking stuff you're not hurting anybody's feelings you're not hurting yourself game on little brother and sister or little sibling um kind of preschool like they all came and they're like yeah that feels real and they'd be like is that was that me oh i know those sandals <laughs> those <are Eva's." laughs> a lot of puffer vests and you know it was like the symphony of puffer vests and Birkenstock Giza sandals. Um, <laughs> but it was, again, it was, you know, it's like, is this a big costume drama? Is this like puff sleeves and getting to build insanity? No, but is this telling an incredible truth and something that's incredibly real and lived and uh, constantly being, constantly being lived and having that, just the pleasure of it over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And being able to whenever, 
when I'm so trying so hard not to accidentally swear on this podcast. It's okay. Um, I know, but I'm trying. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah, we had Stacy Ross on, so it's all good. Okay. You know, it's like shit gets real around here. Like we're about to have another PTA board meeting where we're going to take drinks to the Hotsi Totsi and sit in a parking lot a block from my house, six mm-hmm. feet apart, and shout mm-hmm. about equity and potting. <laughs> and if that's not a Eureka Day consensus moment, that play keeps having resonance. Um, but the fact is, like, when you talk about that's not what this is about. This is about, like, what makes the director designer relationship valuable, or like, how does the director designer relationship grow and build? And that was our first show together. And what I think is important is having a clarity around. As a director, how do you learn best? And as a designer, how do you learn best? And how can you guys teach each other what you love best about the story or how what you Mm. care about the story and how you visualize the story together? Um, And to also have a clarity of like what your boundaries are like, what are you, what are you as a director? What's part of your ability to talk about and what isn't? Like if you are a director, but you are also a company member of said company and you have budgetary understanding of how the show is being handled, that's a different relationship than a director who's a visiting director who has no money relationship to the show whatsoever and therefore cannot talk to and should not have to have a conversation about money reality at the outset, but at some point might need to have a money reality conversation when you were speaking with the production manager or the technical director and you're saying, I'm sorry, baby, we can't afford this thing that you feel is very important. Where one of the things that's nice about you is that you can hold both the sort of creative artistic process and this pragmatic, can we afford this? Which was a big conversation also in earnest. And you're like, can we afford this? And I'm like, no, 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 we got it. And you're like, I don't know. And we did, (laughs) barely, but we did. I don't know how, I do know how. It was gorgeous. But it was some luck and so, <laughs> um but it's one of those things of like being able to know what you as a director can talk to accurately and how you learn best um and being able to express that early on to a new designer relationship and say this is what i'm good at this is where i struggle and if you can meet me where I struggle and I can reach out to you from where I learn best, I think that we can have a really creative conversation and we can learn together. Yeah. Well, like in, in earnest, you were much more familiar with that period. And in fact, you said, can I, can we move this to this period, which is, you know, a few years later than what you had been thinking, because I want to do this thing. And mm-hmm. I, I didn't have the background that you have in costumes, but when you started showing me those images, I was like, oh, okay, I see where you're going with this. This is, yeah. this is great. Yeah, it's like bring a little bit more party, give it a little <laughs> bit because they always it's that first line in earnest where they're like happening in the present day or happening in modern times. Yeah. yeah. But that's like 1890 blah blah or mm-hmm. 19 oh blah blah in you know when it was being written. But the fact that it's supposed to feel crisp and modern and fresh, but we also want to play it oldie timey, but in this crisp, fresh way. So we're sort of trying to thread both needles at once. And if it starts to feel too like when the audience doesn't understand the clothes, it all looks like the Dowager Countess. <laughs> Unless you can tell them that they're looking at the like Sybil, it's all going to look like the Dowager Countess. So you have to let them see what freshness mm. is and you have to see them what fashion or a youth or like a, a for, like a, what the forward motion is and where the touch is between this past and our present to be able to bring people in to see to be able to fall in love with the clothes a little bit and to be able to get on board with, Oh, that's really weird. And it's like the only time Lily has ever gone that long on anything I've ever designed, uh, like where she talked about the clothes. So I felt like I got it right, which is good. Cause sometimes I do a lot of modern. So she just doesn't talk about me, which is also fine. Um, I have a, a really big curiosity. Um, you know, Aurora during this COVID-19 has had to really, pivot so we're we're trying to figure out what it means to to produce cultural events and we've decided on an audio book and that's Mm -hmm. led us down the path of engaging one designer a sound designer so how has the COVID-19 impacted your specific um 
discipline. I mean, I know I thought for a while I wouldn't be <laughs> directing, but I'm actually getting the same number of offers to direct. It's just not for live. And so I wonder, um, in particular for scenic and cost, you know, I, I, Cliff, maybe you're getting more work than ever, but I would love to hear from each of you how your discipline is impacted. This is professional napalm. Uh, it's, it's ground to a halt. It's, yep. I'm a stay at home mom now. I seriously like everything. It's I've got chickens. I've got dogs. I was <laughs> baking bread. Um, I, it, for real, like just I, a sec. Siri has more opinions about my career. It seems she's in the corner. She's got things to say. That's my daughter's painting on my easel. That's not mine from the last time. My, yeah, no, it's, it's my career is dead until COVID is back online. I can, I can create online classes, but I can't work because I have two little kids and somebody actually has to run a digital homeschool starting in the fall. So even the teaching work that I had lined up for the fall, I had like online classes at AAU where I've been teaching for a decade. I had to can them. I'm handing them off to somebody else. I can't teach. Yeah. Yeah. I was, um, I, I was, I was booked until, let me turn this phone off. I was booked until 2022 and really happily. So, and then boom, you know, so I'm finding new ways to teach lighting, new ways to, to, you know, be involved, but I really, really miss the craft on stage. And I miss uh, my community. I miss my theater community. I worry about the young people for whom if they're not hanging lights and doing things, they're not working. So I'm very concerned about them. And there's a, there's a deep sense of loss for me. I mean, I would double down on everything everyone said. I, I haven't gotten a, a huge amount of work out of audio only dramas yet. Um, although I would say it's, I gotta say it's, it uh, has raised the profile of sound design a little bit among some of my peers. Um, so I think that might be a good thing for, for me and my sound pals, but um, um, yeah. And uh, you know, the thing I would say, I, I, I love the creativity I'm seeing out of theaters right now and, and streaming productions and try and audio dramas, you know, and, and I, and I do see a future where theaters employ some of those tools to like extra revenue streams or, you know, extra ways of getting the work out there, you know, but I, I, I do feel like, you know, we're all just waiting to get back into the room. I, you know, I don't, this is, I love what everyone's doing. I'm going to watch it and listen to it. And, and I'm encouraged by all the activity, but let's get back in the theater, please. That's my yeah. feeling. Yeah. Yes. Yes. At, at Cal State East Bay, we're doing our, our fall play online as a Zoom production. And we've, uh, I, I'm still working with designers though. We've, we have a student. We're doing some of the same stuff at SF State. Yeah. And student, uh, student lighting designer. And we're pretending right now that we're going to do the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, pretend is what we do in theater. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Creative problem solvers. Creative that's, problem solving, that's right. Uh, that is yeah. what we do. Um, but right. I do think it's important for people to know that um, a whole industry of highly skilled, highly trained individuals are are out of work right now, you know, mm -hmm. and that theater isn't, isn't just a hobby. This is like a vocation that you've all dedicated many years of study and training and, you know, perfecting your crafts. Um, and you're and you're not working right now, and that's yeah. that's sad. And and and, and we want to do our part to get you back working. Well, and shout out to Theater Bay Area and the Performing Arts Worker Relief Fund, um, which mm -hmm. Aurora has, has supported, and which I encourage mm -hmm. everyone to support. They're really um, trying to take care of as many people as they can. Absolutely. Yeah. We're just about out of time here, but I want to hear um, one more thing from each of you, if you don't mind. I'd love to hear, you know, something that is uh, something that is bringing you joy uh, in the middle of all this right now. What's what's bringing you joy this week, <laughs> Stephanie? Why don't you go first? Um, 
I call it catering for one. I have a young housemaid who's a grad student and I love to cook. And so I've been catering for one. You know, she likes this, she likes that. I made stuffed cabbage today. And <clears throat> that and gardening has been bringing me joy. How about Richard? Um, I've been working in our backyard um, for about six weeks now. We dug a fish pond and Ooh. got um, little baby goldfish just yesterday. So that's, that's been kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so enthusiastic. <laughs> what about you, Cliff? What's, what's bringing you joy? Uh, you know, I mean, I've been playing a lot more music lately and um you know, I got to say, it's been fun sort of refocusing, you know, my activities around things I'm just want to do for my own self instead of for a play or for something some yes. director might want. I'm going to do things okay. that I want for a little while. Um, and I also just, you know, I think um, the thing I would say, I, I think periods of inactivity are kind of important for for me to kind mm -hmm. of recharge. Um, and um I think I'm fully recharged and ready to get back out there, but um, but it's been a some of this some of this has been good. If you could take away the the paranoia re revolving around the pandemic, <laughs> some of it's been some of it's very been very good. So, and Maggie, what about you? Um, I've been really enjoying working in my backyard and hanging out with my kids and training my dogs that are growing faster than I can imagine, even though they're still very small animals and won't get bigger, that much bigger, um, to uh, be better at being dogs. Um, so yeah, I'm, it's really fun. It's, I, I would like to say that I miss being in tech right now and not being cold and working for 14 or 16 hours a day <laughs> and, and all of that but I am, I'm not too unhappy about enjoying a glass of white wine in my backyard and <laughs> teaching the little boogers to roll over. Well, thank you all so, so much for this conversation. It's, it's so great to see you all. I miss you and I wish we were um, working on shows together right now. We will. Miss we you will, too. we will. All of your cases. Thank you. So great to have you all on. Um, you guys, can I can I just give a, a little shout out to my my dear friend who passed away last week, Marge Glicks, yeah. who is one of Aurora's founders. Mm. Um, props for the first ten seasons, mm. uh, all through the City Club days and through the move to. Um, and she was a really inspiring person to me. You know, she was one of a group of of people in their 60s who founded the company. Like they did that when they were mm. started up a little startup theater company. Um, and she loved the theater her whole life and uh, mm. was really an amazing person. I miss her dearly. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for bringing mm -hmm. her into the room again this week. Yeah. Yeah, we've been hearing a lot about Marge in the last week, and it's it's really sad. And she was clearly just such a special person and a big part of, of this company and a lot of companies in the Bay Area. Mm. Hmm. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up. Thank you again, everybody. Um, I want to mention um, uh, the uh, we, we like to uh, lift up another company at the end of each episode and uh, somebody that's doing good work in the community. So we want to mention the Ella Baker Center. Uh, which works late, locally, statewide, and nationally to shift resources away from prisons and punishment and towards okay. opportunities that make our communities safe, healthy, and strong. They believe that what you water grows. That's why they mobilize everyday people to build power and prosperity in our communities. You can check them out at ellabakercenter.org. Mm -hmm. And please, as always, send us questions to answer, topics to cover, quotes you want us to read. That email is connects at auroratheater.org, connects at auroratheater.org. And you can always drop something on the Facebook comment or YouTube comment, hit like and subscribe. 
And be sure to check out our membership program at auroratheater.org. You can make donations at auroratheater.org. And uh, next week on Aurora Connects, we have Suzanne Simpson, who is the executive producer of Masterpiece. Um, so this is a little different for us, uh, but we're going to be talking with the executive producer of Downton Abbey. Uh, so, so tune in next week and find out all about, uh, about Masterpiece. Thanks all. That will be our season closer next week. We'll take a one week hiatus and we will be back with Aurora Connects season two, if you can believe it. So we hope you'll continue to join us. Um, thanks again to our guests. Thank you for watching and thank you for staying connected. Bye friends. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>